But if you really think it through, you'll realize it means revolution. Hello and welcome to the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft, and in this episode, we're going to take a fresh look at humankind and ask whether kindness itself is the secret to our success. Rutger Bregman, who became something of a viral sensation after taking on the billionaires at Davos, has written a book that goes all the way back to the emergence of Homo sapiens as the dominant species and incorporates the latest research into our behaviour today to see whether, at heart, we're actually pretty decent. We spoke from our relative isolations about kindness, community and turning traditional thinking on its head. Uh, Rutger, thank you for joining me remotely, uh, first of all. How are things where you are? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um... It's uh, obviously a strange situation, as it is for everyone. Uh, but it's not that bad for your productivity, actually, as a writer. Uh, I mean, no more meetings. <laughs> uh, a lot of time to read and to think. So, uh, yeah. You finally get that, that thing that writers crave, which is sort of, you know, focused time to yourself, where you can actually get some work done. Yeah, a little bit. But then at the same time, uh, you know, especially at the beginning of the crisis, every sort of day felt like a year so you would start writing something and then it already felt dated like yeah <laughs> an yeah. hour after you started so uh, actually i have been working on an essay for more than a month now and, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not finished yet <laughs> um when i sort of was thinking about what we wanted to do with the podcast this season um i really wanted to talk to some authors that would allow me to put some positive thoughts out into the ether uh this mm -hmm. is before obviously there was any um health crisis around the world um and i heard about your book humankind which is there to sort of i suppose give an, not an alternative version of human history but but one that shows that humans as a species are perhaps more kind than we have been led to believe i'm giving a very bad potted version of what your book is about maybe you <laughs> maybe maybe you could give the synopsis better well i think up. that's pretty much it actually <laughs> i think it's a good summary um, I mean, it, I was thinking that is exactly the kind of book that I would like to read right now. Um, but of course, at the same time, why that maybe I wouldn't believe it when I read it. And I think one really good place to start is with our literary audience as well, is mm -hmm. a, an example of something that really makes clear what we're talking about here. So many people will be familiar with the book, Lord of the Flies, um, mm -hmm. and the premise of a, a group of boys left their own devices on an island, and they demonstrate through this time alone that there is a thin veneer of civilization over human beings mm -hmm. and actually at root we are sort of horrible savages who treat each other appallingly but you mm -hmm. discovered a kind of a true story of the Lord of the Flies and in fact the mm -hmm. true story is very different to the to the novel that people will know could you tell us a bit more about that yeah sure so when I started working on this book I knew that I couldn't get around Lord of the Flies right it's one of the the most influential novels of the 20th century, right? And William Golding, the author, even re received the Nobel Prize uh, because he so realistically sort of depicted uh, the human condition, according to the Swedish committee. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's one of the best examples that I know of uh, what, what scientists call veneer theory, which is indeed this idea that civilization is only a thin veneer and that as soon as something happens, say uh, a natural disaster or you shipwreck on an island, that we humans reveal our true selves. And that, you know, in the end, we're all just animals, monsters, beasts, you know, that we uh, deep down, we're all selfish. Um, and so I knew I would have to do something with with The Lord of the Flies. And uh, I had read it when I was, I don't know, 16 years old. And I remember that it made a big impression on me, you mm. know. It was like uh, after reading Harry Potter and lots of other children's books, it was like, okay, so finally a realistic depiction of human nature. That's that's how it felt back then, I, I remember. But while I was writing this book, I thought, you know, has it ever actually happened? Because Lord of the Flies is a novel, right? Mm -hmm. It's fiction. Um, but has it actually really happened once, you know, that kids did shipwreck on an island and how would they behave? So you start doing some digging and you discover that, you know, there's no university around the globe that has ever attempted this experiment, probably because it would be a little bit unethical to just drop kits on an island. Uh, <laughs> but then I wondered, you know, has it ever happened by accident? You know, did sometime, somewhere, anywhere, kids just, I don't know, steal a boat, end up in a storm, shipwreck on an island. Uh, and I started, you know, researching this, basically starting just on Google. And uh, I found one sort of obscure blog 
uh, where you know there was a short story about uh, an island near Tonga, which it's you know it's an island group in the Pacific Ocean hmm. near Australia, where supposedly six kids had indeed stolen a boat, ended up in a storm, shipwrecked, and had survived on a small rocky island for 15 months, you know, for more than a year. Mm. And supposedly this was a story of friendship, you know, and, and that they had, you know, that they are still friends up until this day. Mm. And so I had this one anecdote uh, and I, I just wanted to know more about it because I didn't, I wasn't sure whether it was reliable because everywhere, you know, I, I looked, I found the exact same story with the exact same phrasings, right? And uh, as you... Uh, as I traced it down, I in the end, I came upon a book that was published uh, in the 80s w that told this story, but that had no source. So at some point I thought, you know, this is probably just some fictional story, some kind of myth that goes around on the internet to make people feel good about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I was just lucky. I was really lucky because I was looking in, in the, uh, a big archive of newspapers, of Australian newspapers. And by accident, I was looking in the 60s instead of the 70s because the, the original story said that it happened in 1977. Mm. But by accident, I was looking in the 60s and suddenly I saw it, you know, that it actually happened in 1966. I saw a, a report from Australian newspaper The Age that said six kids had been find, found on the island of Atta, you know, which is a small island near Tonga. And indeed, they had survived there for 15 months. So then I realized, you know, this actually happened and maybe, just maybe, they're still alive mm. because back then the youngest was 13 years old and the oldest was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, maybe I can track them down. So uh, long story short, uh, I took a plane to Australia and I managed to find the captain that rescued these six kids. His name is Peter Warner. He's a pretty extraordinary guy himself, you know. He's the son of Arthur Warner, who was sort of the Rupert Murdoch of that time, you know, extraordinarily powerful man. Mm. But Peter Warner, you know, didn't want to follow in his father's footsteps, so he ran away, he went to the sea, he became a fisherman. And when he was 35 years old, you know, purely by accident, he was just, uh, you know, fishing near this island of Atta when he suddenly heard screaming and suddenly he saw six naked kids you know running over the beach towards him you know hair very long uh, on their shoulders and the first thing he and his man did was grab their guns and just wait because you know back then it was a, a habit to drop very violent criminals on on uninhabited islands in Polynesia so right. <laughs> they were they were very afraid but then these kids came and they said look, can you help us? Can you bring us home? Uh, because we estimate we've been here for more than a year. And, you know, we're from uh, Nuku'alofa, which is the, the capital of, of Tonga. And uh, we went to school there. And so Peter didn't believe it at all. And he said, you know, I got, you know, I'll call with Nuku'alofa and, and see if I can get hold of this school and hear what they say. So he called the operator with the two-way radio. And the radio said, okay, hold on. I'm going to check out if this is true came back 20 minutes later and the operator was all tearful and said, uh, these are the kids, you know, funerals have already been held uh, and, and you found them, you found them. So then Peter realized that it was all true. Mm. And uh, he actually also put me in contact with one of the, the, the original kids uh, themselves, you know, uh, Mano, who was back then 15 years old and is now 70 years old. And uh, the two of them who are, you know, today still the best of friends <laughs> told me uh, what really happened. And you know what? If it would be a Hollywood movie, people would say, this is worse than Love Actually. You know, <laughs> this is so sentimental. This is so unrealistic and naive. This, is, this would never happen. But the thing is, it actually did happen. So, um, yeah, they survived because of friendship, because of courage because of resilience and uh, they're friends up until this day.
It's an extraordinary story, uh, and I think particularly with with children, you worry that with that fifty months is a long time if you do not know how to look after yourself. And then, as you mm-hmm. say, it is only through working together and through community and friendship that they were able to survive that long, and for for nothing too bad to actually happen to them. In that yeah, time. yeah, yeah. One nice extraordinary detail was that you know obviously they ended up in fights now and then. Yeah. But then one would go to one side of the island, and the other would go to the other side of the island. Yeah. They would call off a little, you know, cry a little and then come back and say sorry. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's it's the it would be very boring for a novel, right? You wouldn't <laughs> you wouldn't get the Nobel Prize for literature if you would write a scene like that. Yeah. But here we are. It actually happened like that. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? Because we think that, you know, in order for something to be to be good fiction that it would need to have that kind of drama and conflict. But actually every day we turn on the news and that's what's reported to us is drama, conflict, murder, yeah. mayhem, bad news. And you yeah. make a really good point in this book about the news cycle and about why it's why negativity tends to win on a news cycle, why it's what yeah. dominates our news. And that in yeah. fact, if we were actually reporting what's going on in the world, it it could be one good news story after another that explains that you are now less likely to die of uh, all sorts of things. Long Life spans are longer than they ever have been. Plane flights mm-hmm. are safer than they have been. But that's not how news works, is it? No, no. The news is mostly about exceptions, mostly about things that go wrong. You know, crises, corruption, violence, wars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you watch a lot of the news, at the end of the day, you know exactly how the world doesn't work. You know, you have this completely upside down view of of reality, of history, and of human nature itself. Uh, psychologists have known this for a long time, actually. Uh, they have a term for this. They call it mean world syndrome. So people who have watched a lot of the news, they tend to think that other people can't be trusted. They, you know, are often more cynical, often a bit more depressed as well. Mm. Uh, so yeah, that is, that is called mean world syndrome. It's uh, it's it's a dangerous drug, I'd say. The news. Yeah. Uh, even though I do think you have to make an, a very important distinction between the news and journalism, right? I mean, not all, all journalism is like the news. There's a lot of important in-depth reporting that helps you to understand the world, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, th- I think that you have to st- sort of steer clear of the news. As you, you make a good point, which is that actually, if you want to remain engaged in what's happening in the world, it's possible to do that sort of less frequently. So you, you read your journalism perhaps at the weekend or, you know, from, from wherever you want to get your news from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it, also, I mean, it goes much deeper than just the news, right? Because I started thinking about why do so many people think that most other people, you know, not their friends or co-workers or family members or whatever, but those other people, those strangers are not good, are bad, Mm. are Mm. selfish. You know, where does this come from? And obviously, you know, on the surface, sort of the the first explanation that is is indeed the the kind of information that we get, which is sort of the news that, you know, bombards us every day with, you know, pessimistic, cynical stories. But it actually goes much deeper than that. Because, for example, this veneer theory, this idea that civilization is only very thin veneer, it's so deeply embedded in Western culture. Mm. It goes back all the way to the ancient Greeks, uh, you find it with the early Christian church fathers, you know, St. Augustine that said, uh, who said um, uh, that we're all born as sinners or read the Enlightenment philosophers, uh, David Hume or Thomas Hobbes, who said that, you know, originally we lived all nasty, brutish and short lives. Mm. Um, so again and again and again, this idea pops pops up in in western culture it's it's really deeply embedded and and indeed i think you find it in our in our literature as well it's also a little bit a matter of uh you know what is actually exciting Mm -hmm. um i think uh, tolstoy had this this fascinating observation i think it was in anna karenina that he said you know every happy family is happy in exactly the same way but mm-hmm. then, then every unhappy family is happy, un- unhappy in different ways, right? Mm-hmm. So you can have a novel for every unhappy family, but all the happy families get only one novel, and it's <laughs> going to be a boring novel as well. So this is, I mean, this is the difficulty, obviously. It is. Um, we, we'll talk a bit later about how you can actually flip that sort of philosophy on its head, the, the veneer theory. But I wanted to talk about this idea that you mentioned, which is a chapter you call Homo Puppy, which is this mm-hmm. idea about looking about why the human species, Homo sapiens, um, succeeded against the other sort of uh, hominids that were living on the planet at the time and, and mm-hmm. why 
kindness, friendliness might actually be a crucial part of where our intelligence and success comes from. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yes, of course. So what has happened in the past 20 to 30 years is that scientists from very diverse disciplines, anthropologists, archaeologists, psychologists, but also biologists have moved to a much more hopeful view of human nature. And the really exciting thing that I discovered while researching this book is that they often don't even know it from each other. Right? because they're all so specialized is that they don't realize what's happening in a field next to theirs. Right? Mm -hmm. At one point, I talked with a psychologist who's done some extraordinary work on the so-called bystander effect, and you know how people behave during times of crisis and emergency when someone is drowning, for example, or, or is attacked in the street. And psychologists used to believe that you know people don't do anything and they don't help each other. Now we actually have very robust empirical evidence that in 90% of all cases, people do help each other. Hmm. So I was telling her about new theories in biology and she said, oh my God, so it's happening there as well. <laughs> I think that that is fascinating. So what's been happening in biology is that uh, biologists have developed this new theory that they call self-domestication theory. And the idea is pretty simple, actually. Um, what has happened during thousands of years is that the kindest, the friendliest among us have had the most kids and so have had the biggest chance of passing on their genes to the next generation. Biologists call this survival of the friendliest. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very different from sort of the, the, the old fashioned, sort of more cynical interpretation of evolution. Mm. Um, what, what they're basically saying is that the reason that we as human beings conquered the world and why we built Musea uh, with the Neanderthals, you know, on this play there and not the other way around, mm. is that we have this one superpower, which is the capacity for kindness and cooperation. We are just incredibly good at cooperating with one another. Um, individually, we human beings are not that special. You know, we're not very smart. If you, you know, do an intelligence test and you let a toddler of two year old, two years old go against, a, a, say, a pig, then often the pig wins, you know, <laughs> uh, which you should keep in mind when you're eating bacon as well, by the way, but that's a different <laughs> book. Uh, but, you know, individually, we're not that special. We're not very strong either. We're not even very good at climbing trees, but then collectively we can do extraordinary things we can actually build culture and we can sort of stand on each other's shoulders. Um, and this is only possible because um, we are friendly enough to do so. Hmm. One of the most striking things I discovered is that actually human beings are the only species among mammals and maybe even in the whole animal kingdom uh, that who blush, mm -hmm. you know? I, I thought that was mind blowing, right? If, if it's really the case that, you know, you have to be selfish to get ahead or be an, an egoist, then why do we involuntarily give our way, give away our feelings mm. when we blush? It's pretty extraordinary. Why? I mean, we don't see that among other uh, primates, you know, chimpanzees don't blush, mm. Bon bonobos don't blush, but we do it. So I, I think that is extraordinary. And it's, I think it just shows you that blushing helps us to cooperate because when someone blushes, your body basically shows, you know, I care about your feelings. Mm. Uh, so, yes, the, sort of the new interpretation of evolution theory is is quite different from the sort of the 70s interpretation. You you probably remember this book from Richard Dawkins, you know, sure. his masterpiece, The Selfish Gene. Mm -hmm. uh, if you read reviews on Amazon of that book, you'll find that some people wish that they had had never read the book because it made them so cynical and depressed. <laughs> uh, and and in that in the first editions of that book, he also had 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 a line where he said, you know, let us teach people to be altruistic and generous because we are born selfish. Mm. Now in later editions, he removed that sentence because indeed, science has been going in a very very different direction mm. uh, in the past couple of years. And so this idea that actually. At our heart, we are, we are good and kind and cooperative, um, leads to a, a sort of, a, as I said, that flipping of the philosophy. So that rather than civilization being a veneer which goes over our brutish nature, that actually mm -hmm. civilization might be the thing that is causing our innate good nature to be 
subsumed by selfishness. So you talk about how the minute that somebody uh, said this piece of land is mine and you're not welcome mm-hmm. on it, then you have this idea of private property. Then you have a problem. You have this sort of conflict mm-hmm. that comes up. And this is yeah. a, a, an idea started by Rousseau, you mentioned in the book. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit more about how that might be actually a more accurate representation of, of human nature. Yeah. So when I was a student, I, I took some philosophy classes and then you find out about this classic debate between the British philosopher Thomas Hobbes and the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And so Thomas Hobbes had this view that when we were still nomadic and togetherers, which we were for around 95% of our history, we lived these horrible lives, you know, as I said, nasty, brutish and short lives. Mm. And in the state of nature, he said there was a war of all against all. Right. So basically everyone was being very horrible and violent. Mm. Now, Rousseau, took the opposite position. He said, no, 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 no. As hunter-gatherers, we were pure. We were good. You know, we lived pretty good lives and everything went wrong. Indeed, when someone said, you know, see this piece of land here, that's mine. Uh, And other people were stupid enough to believe him. (laughs) It was probably a him, right? Um, And so it's indeed civilization itself, according to Rousseau, that was the problem. Now, when I went to university, I really got the impression that, you know, Uh, Hobbes was the realist. He's often seen as the founder of the, or one of the founders of the realist school in political philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and Rousseau was sort of the idealist, right? The romantic, the, well, not the scientific one uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, But then for this book, I started, you know, really going much deeper into, you know, the latest evidence from anthropology and archaeology. And at some point I had the idea, I was like, I should, I should give my book the title Rousseau was right <laughs> because basically most of the evidence we have right now is, is, you know, pointing in his direction. Hmm. Um, many people will have read or at least have heard of Stephen Pinker's famous book, uh, the better angels of our nature, which is about the, the decline of violence in human history, mm-hmm. uh, where he sort of yeah, pr- pretty much takes sides with Hobbes and, also tries to show that hunter-gatherers indeed are very violent. But then uh, I discovered that actually, even though those kind of books and theories and newspaper articles get a lot of attention, uh, actually sort of the academic research is, uh, is going in a very opposite direction. The evidence for war, for example, in, in, in prehistory, or at least when we were uh, nomadic hunter-gatherers, so when we didn't live in cities yet or in villages and when we didn't have uh, do agriculture yet hmm. the evidence for war is pretty much non-existent uh it's much more likely uh, that the the history of war had a beginning and it began with civilization itself hmm. which is a fascinating i mean it's a, it's, as i say it's a really huge flip of that philosophy um you of course had your moment of viral sensation when you were at Davos and, and you sort of I suppose you you were confronting a lot of these people who are absolutely upholding the idea of private property uh, mm-hmm. wealth accumulation and things like that and I wondered whether part of your experiences there feeds into this book with this idea of that there are certain types of people and you talk about how power does indeed corrupt because of course it's built on one person saying this is mine it's not yours and that that leads to a yeah. conflict of human nature yeah well this book was published uh in september so uh september 2019 in dutch hmm. and a lot of a lot of journalists said you know it's we think it's a very strange book because first you you rail against the billionaires in davos <laughs> then you are you know, you have, end up in this fight with Tucker Carlson, the Fox News host, and now you're arguing that most people are friendly. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> make up your mind, dude. What's going on here? But indeed, uh, I think the longer title of my book would have been Humankind, But Power Corrupts, right? Power is an incredibly dangerous drug. We've got, you know, mountains and mountains of scientific evidence that shows that sort of power disconnects you from other people. Mm. And we, we know that those in power have, are, uh, you know, feel less empathy, are less cooperative, are more narcissistic, etc., etc. And human beings have actually known this for a long time. So nomadic hunter-gatherers have known this. And, and so what they did and, and still do uh, is basically they use shame, which is an incredibly important tool uh, to uh, 
uh, make sure that people don't think too much of themselves. Mm. And if people become really arrogant, then there can be group pressure or you can uh, exclude someone from the gr group or even, you know, if it's really necessary, use violence. Um, but that's sort of how nomadic and together has kept their uh, societies egalitarian. Um, in our civilized age, obviously, inequality has spiraled, spiraled around, uh, out of control. Mm. And it's often very hard to, uh, to keep it in check uh, these days. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the, the double uh, view of humanity that I have. So yes, indeed, uh, human beings have evolved to be friendly and to be kind and to cooperate, but power is a very dangerous thing. So any society always needs to think very hard about how do you keep uh, those who are in power, how do you keep them in check? And, and can you spread the power around as much as possible? You, you mentioned sort of in the book that what you're hoping is that that through reading these moments of history and, and sort of looking at some of the more recent history as well in a slightly different way, that people will change their view of what human nature is absolutely like. But I just sort of wonder whether, you know, if, if some of those facts don't quite do it for people, are there things that we can do? Are there actions that we uh, can sort of share with people that would help other people to realise that actually mm -hmm. by nature, most people that you meet are well-intentioned, kind, and, and, and there to sort of cooperate with? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it all starts with what you assume in other people, mm -hmm. right? Because what you assume in other people is often what you get out of them. If you assume, as we have been doing, basically, uh, for the past 40 years, uh, if we assume that most people are selfish and, you know, that they're just egoists, and if we start designing our institutions around that idea, our schools, our workplaces our democracies, then that's what we'll get, you know? You'll, the, the, your theory of human nature, if it presupposes that people are selfish, then that's how people will behave. Uh, there's some fascinating evidence from economics, for example. E uh, economists have for a long time believed in this uh, homo economicus worldview, right? That indeed people are just selfish and want to get as much as themselves for, as possible. And then what they find is that if you... Uh, do some simple behavioral tests on students, you find that as they progress in their studies, you know, they go from first year student to second year, third year, they become more selfish <laughs> because sort of, yeah, you create the kind of people that your theory presupposes. Mm. Um, I think we can turn that around. I think that we can go to a very different kind of society if we design our institutions on a different view of human nature. So take the example of schools, for example. Sort of the the classic sort of strict British boarding school is, I think, basically based on the idea that people are selfish and that you need competition, etc. Mm. Uh, and we know that this results in a lot of bullying behavior. There's some great sociology uh, on how where bu bullying comes from, and actually, it's it's really an an a result of how we design our institutions, right? Bullying is not some something that is, how do you say that? It's, it's, um, it's not in the stars. It's not just simply part of human nature. It's really a matter of circumstances as well. Mm. I think this is actually one of the great tragedies of the success of the Harry Potter series. Because it's so <laughs> many, I mean, it's, it, to be honest, it's, it's my favorite, still my favorite book ever written. Mm. I'm just reading it to my little brother. It's just fantastic, but still, so many people read it and, and thought, you know, I'm going to send my get to boarding school. It's horrible. It's horrible because we know that there's so much evidence that there's so much more bullying at, yeah. at these kind of schools where there's less freedom. So you need actually school breathing schools, right? In my book, I give the example of a school where they just abolished homework. They abolished tests. They abolished classes. They put kids of all different levels and backgrounds together and they all have their individual learning pathways. And you know what? It works. It mm. sounds like some crazy communist anarchist utopia, but you go there and you realize, wait a minute, intrinsic motivation is actually a thing. Mm. You know, <laughs> it's kids are naturally curious. You don't have to sort of pay a kid uh, for the kid to learn how to walk, right? Mm -hmm. It just learns to walk because it's, it's interesting. So why can't we design our whole education around that simple idea that intrinsic motivation is an incredibly powerful thing? 
And making these changes, sometimes it's so hard to sort of even begin to make those changes. But I wondered whether as awful as the current situation is with people in lockdown and and a big health crisis going around the world, what it is doing is actually forcing people to behave very, very differently. Here are we Mm -hmm. having this conversation remotely, but also we can see on the news, finally some good news, communities working together, neighbours communicating better than they ever have before in order to help each other out in this very, very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And I wondered whether in that you maybe see the seeds of something very, very positive for the future as we think about maybe different ways of living with each other and cooperating. I think so, yes. So if we go back to the Second World War, it was in 1942 that the Beveridge Report was published, right? It was sort of the founding document of the welfare state in Britain. Mm. So they didn't wait until after the war, but it was, you know, when the bombs were falling on London, when the plan was drawn up, to, you know, move Mm -hmm. towards a much better society. Um, I start my book in in Britain as well with the example of what happened during the Blitz. Mm. Um, It's it's really interesting to see is that actually the experts predicted that, you know, as soon as the Germans would start bombing Britain, you know, everything would be pandemonium and that people would go nuts and crazy and would panic and that the army could, wouldn't even be able to fight because they would have their hands full with the masses, right? Who would mm-hmm. gone crazy. Um, and as as we all know, pretty much the opposite happened, right? Keep calm and carry on. And there were lots of funny jokes made by by people throughout throughout Britain. You know, I, I love these remarks of, of for example, uh, pub owners who were just bombarded and had all the, the windows blown away. And then they put up these signs like, more open than usual. <laughs> uh, pretty hilarious. <laughs> Uh, and um, so then the question in in 1942 and 1943 was uh, for the for the British, you know, what are we going to do with our bombers? Because we've just seen what happens if you bomb a population. Uh, so maybe we should do something differently. Maybe bomb factories and roads or infrastructure or something instead of the population. Mm. But then the experts uh, came back again and said, no, 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 no. Um, we got to bomb German cities and the general population because, you know, we British, we're a special case, obviously. You know, we're such wonderful, brilliant people. <laughs> we can withstand this. But if we start bombing the morally inferior Germans, they will very quickly panic, right? And so that's what they did. And in the end, 10 times as many bombs were dropped on Germany as were dropped on Britain during the Blitz. And the result was pretty much the same. So Mm. also in Germany, you saw an explosion of altruism and cooperation. And actually, the the cities that were bombers the hardest had a higher production, a higher war production than the cities that were not bombed. Mm. So economists later said, there's one economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, the American economist, who said this was probably the greatest miscalculation of the war. A a huge misunderstanding of human nature, you know, is that... Throughout history, we see this again and again and again, is that those in power think that other people are like themselves, right? Which is mm-hmm. selfish. <laughs> it's <laughs> sort of as if they look in the mirror. Um, and and this is also, I think, the reason why throughout history, those in power have often sort of fought the idea that most people are actually pretty decent because it's a very revolutionary and radical idea. Hmm. If we can trust each other, then we don't need them, right? We don't need the presidents and the CEOs and the managers and the kings and the monarchs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's only if we if we are indeed selfish, then we need to be managed and we need to be controlled and we need all this bureaucracy, etc. Hmm. So it may sound very sort of, uh, how do you say this? Very naive and nice and optimistic. Oh, people are evolved to be to to be friendly, etc. Hmm. Uh, but if you really think it through, you realize it means revolution. Yeah, um, it would be very interesting to see whether any of the changes that people are having to make to their lives at the moment continue uh, once these sort of measures are are, um, released and and people come out of lockdown. Um, I wonder whether there are lessons for people to learn that could improve things in the future. Uh, As you say, particularly that community uh, spirit, that idea of ordinary people working together um, does give a huge amount of hope to me, actually, that 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 character means less need to rely on on those in power uh, to tell us what to do. Um, 
but as you say, it, it, it's not so much about being hopeful and naive. It, it's quite a revolutionary concept to sort of say, actually, we can do this. Yeah, and it's also about redefining what it means to be a realist. So um, very often when people say, be a little bit more realistic, they say, be a little bit more cynical or be a bit more pessimistic, you know, give yeah. up your hopes and dreams and ideals. Um, what I'm saying is that, now, it's actually realistic to be more hopeful. It's actually realistic to think that most people are, you know, often pretty decent. Um, and um, you're actually naive if you still cling to the veneer theory yeah. of who we really are. Ruga, I could talk to you so much about so many of the aspects of this book because there's so much rich information in there, but I'm not going to let you give away all the good stuff. We'll have to let <laughs> readers get in there. But it was really fantastic to speak to you. And as I say, that sort of the, the, the positive message um, that I hoped to find when I started reading the book was e even greater than I expected by the time I'd finished it. So thank you for human kindness. It's, it's just a great read. Thanks so much for having me. Really enjoyed this.